container talks. Um, we'd call their stuff fat containers, and you know they're they're a really useful tool. But we tend to try to think of containers as this slim little wrapper around an application, and so we have containers that have only one thing running in them, or one thing and its children. Um, I, to introduce myself, uh, hi, my name's Sven. I work for Docker Inc. I'm a support engineer there. Um, I also work on the documentation, so uh, I really appreciate bugs and issues and emails saying, that doesn't make sense, can you explain it better? Because then we can. Um, and also, I work on Boot to Docker, which is slowly becoming Docker Machine. Um, hi. <laughs> now, most people seem to get the feeling, because of our tutorials, I think, and the way we talk about it, that when you build a container, you're going to end up with all of Ubuntu, all of the dependencies, and you're going to end up with this many hundred meg container image. Um, and then if you're going to build from source, it's even worse because you're going to end up with GCC or whatever it is that you're building with. And I just thought I'd do a quick tutorial to a small, tiny room of people about how you can not do that. Um, one of the things when you're trying to manage your, your, your containers is you've got to ba choose a base image. And we see people following the tutorial. So they'll have some things based on Ubuntu, some things based on Debian, some things based on CentOS. And you end up running out of disk space. Um, and the thing that when you're actually going to start using containers that you need to think about is that you should try to have a common environment. It's no different to virtual machines in that respect. Um, if you have all the OSs, you're going to have to learn how to manage all of the OSs. Um, so don't do that. Um, and here, it's just a list of some of the uh, container images that we provide and their re respective sizes. Um, I personally like Scratch a lot. Um, it's a little bit large, we're working on it. Um, but as you can see, we haven't changed it in a while, so you know, if you find a security issue, please report it. Um, I picked Debian because I don't like RPMs. Um, I'm willing to admit that that's because I know Debian a little bit better. Um, and it has less to do with System D than I used to think it might. <laughs> and so I would, I mean, I, I do use Debian wherever I can because, yeah, coming back to that table, it's quite a bit smaller. Although the really cool thing you can see there is that the latest version of Ubuntu is a very similar size. It used to be about 300 meg. Um, so having picked my base image, and I'm going to pretend that the Docker hub guys have done a good job, which personally I think if you're going to deploy, you, shouldn't, you should actually make your own base image because then you know what's in it. Um, and therefore have some idea of the security risks that you have. Whereas if you just trust us and don't bother learning about it, you're kind of, well, hoping. Um, trust us, nonetheless. <laughs> but the security guys quite rightfully say, don't use Docker pull, um, because in the end, you're just running random binaries you got from the internet. <laughs> so as an example of some of the horrible things you can do, all I did was pull out some of the files I decided I didn't need, and suddenly I have an image here that's almost half the size of the base image that we distribute. The one we distribute is slightly more useful uh, in that your locales still work. Um, but if you're like me, you may not need them. Um, what else was I going to say? And the way I did this is I ran docker build on this docker file, which starts from the Debian 7.7, uh, which I think is wheezy. Um, just delete some files and go. And then I use docker export to create the tar file that is that image and re-imported it as a single layer because that docker file will actually create three layers right now. The from one, which is your original image, the layer in the union file system that says these files have been removed, and then another layer for the metadata um, I suspect that work's going on to make that into two, but nonetheless it's a base image, so you'd like to actually squash that down to one. Um, and then you, there you see my version. And then the really neat trick is to actually use that base image um, instead of using Ubuntu, CentOS, Crux, and you, you so on. Because 
with AUFS at the moment, and I suspect with overlay for FS, but I don't know yet, haven't used it in anger enough, um, when binaries come from the same layer in all of your images when you're running them as containers, they'll actually share as much memory as the kernel will let them. Um, slight disadvantage with device mapper and butterfs is that it doesn't share memory. So your libc will be in memory again and again and again. Just a bit of a shame. Um, and of course, the other nice thing about using the one image is that you'll know if you need to update your base image for security reasons, you just have to rebuild all your images. There's no, do I need to rebuild this, that, and the other? The answer is yes. Um, and then the bigger trick is, that was just the ops answer. The development, testing, and debugging answer is to make similar images that contain all of your tools. I seem to be doing a talk about that tomorrow, um, where instead of your developers getting a list of tools that they need to build your product, and each product having a different version of GCC or different version of Java, what you do is you tell them, for this version of your product, use these containers. And for the next version, use other containers, which your ops guys or your dev guys curate. So your new developer turns up and goes, what do I do? And you say, well, you're working on this, so Docker pull today's environment. And there it is. And they're instantly on a machine that they're able to do work on. Um, in tomorrow's thing, the example I'm going to uh, I'm going to show is I've got NetBeans running in a container. Um, obviously, if you actually use Java, you'd have lots of other things. I just have Hello World. Um, and the thing I read on a, on someone's blog post the other day was if you do this with your development environment and your ops environment and your debug environment, escrow becomes nothing. Now, if you've worked on the escrow project after you've deli del delivered to customers, you'll know it takes a few weeks of reverse engineering, all these mad little assumptions where somebody says, well, I started with a Windows box, and then I loaded this, and I've got DevEnv, but I can't remember what version, and so on. You know, you've got to go through the whole process of figuring out all of the unwritten requirements, whereas a Docker container either works or it doesn't. And if you're deploying from a Docker container, it's got all of the tools you need. And even more so if you maintain your own base image. Um, because, well, it's a lot more stable now, but a year ago when we started doing base images, you'd find your Debian or your Ubuntu image would suddenly change dramatically. Um, whereas if you do your own, obviously you know what's in it. And you only put things in there for a reason. Um, <laughs> Okay, once we have our images, I mean our base images, then the next thing is you're going to end up with a development environment uh, Docker file that looks a little like this. This one's a canned example that I'm doing later. Um, but, you know, lots and lots of things happening. And each one of those statements, uh, instructions, will give you a new layer. And while this sounds lovely, um, and it is, these layers will contain things that you don't care about. Um, and if, for the sake of argument, some here after I've done the make install up there, um, I might do a make clean because I obviously don't want the source anymore. The source is still in the layers that get unioned up to the final image. And obviously we don't want to go and push many gigabytes worth of stuff only to tell it to delete them in the next step. Um, so the next thing to consider is, is squashing down to fewer layers. Um, and there's a few ways to do that. Actually, big question, who here's used Docker? Am I speaking to people who... Does that look like more than half? Ah, mad. Okay. So I'm, I'm showing you commands that, that will make sense to those of you who've played with Docker. For those of you who haven't, I'm sorry. I pitched this at people who had. Um, ask me lots of questions. <laughs> How am I doing for time? Cool. So I'll speed up and then we can have questions. <laughs> um, so there's a number of ways to squash. The one that I used earlier was basically to export and import again. Um, people have written tools that essentially do the same thing and they just simplify the process. Um, and then there are some really 
cool tricks that you can do where, for example, Docker Run Builder, in the second example, spits out the tarball that then gets sent to Docker Build. Um, it's kind of called the property transform, transform because he was the first one to, to talk about it lots. Um, and so that's one way that you can get your Docker initial build. So you might, you, you'd have a Docker file in your um, system that then does something similar to configure, build stuff, and then spits out a tar file that gets built into your final binary, um, which could look much like the earlier one. Um, or similarly, the other trick I saw on the internet just recently, where you just have a Docker run that will download all of the, uh, the prerequisites before you then build the image. So it's not quite as powerful as the, the, the second example, but it's still very useful. And the last one, which is where you're basically telling Docker, we'll give you the keys to the kingdom and you can do whatever you like. Um, so the thing to note with the last example is that you're handing your container full and utter control of your computer. You're giving it root access, uh, which is really handy, but hopefully is really scary to most of you. Um, I do it all the time. I love it. <laughs> okay, so the real thing is static binaries. And as you can see the example there, people seem to like Go because they think I can make myself a static binary. Except, of course, there are some libraries that will still be needed here and there. Um, so instead we work in assembler. This container here is a huge 900 bytes. Um, and spitting out that text is all it does. Uh, we use it in our demos to make sure that your Docker actually works. But that's an example of what I think Docker containers will work towards. Um, because all you really want to have is a specification of not only how to get the thing running, but what few things it does. So this one, in my opinion, should eventually have a spec that goes with it that says, I don't need access to any devices, I don't need any privileges, I need nothing. I don't need a network. All I need is to throw you some characters. And that's it. Um, and that's something at the moment that seems to me to be missing from everything, RPM, Debian, you name it. We, we don't know from your deb file what devices it's going to access. You've got to kind of read the documentation or which files it's going to access. Um, and to that end, I thought I'd do an example of building Eng Nginx um, and making a micro container out of it. And that's the horror command that I did to make it go. <laughs> and I guess I shall explain it. Um, okay, so the first line there, what I'm doing is because we don't have uh, docker minus build minus f, so we can't specify another file as a docker file yet, that's next version. Um, I'm caching the docker file and I'm not using any of the files in my context, so in my current directory, apart from that. And then my docker file goes off and does all the work. It downloads, well, it installs the prerequisites I need to build Nginx and then it gets all the source code, configures it, um, then builds it and gives me the things that I need to test it. And I'll go into the, the lower lines later. Um, and so I now have a build container that's huge, I think it's 1.4 gig, um, which I can then use to spit out a tar file that contains just the output result, which is the second line is basically just grabbing that tar file. And then in the third file, I'm importing that as a single layer image and running it. And that's it. And of course it crashes because for some reason it's expecting a Unix system. <laughs> so we use our Linux to tell us what it's up to. Um, and I was originally going to use LDD, but then I kind of figured this is actually better. It'll tell me more. And happily it tells me I think I need like six files and some libraries. Um, Unfortunately, you can't see the rest, but it needs etc. password, etc. groups, um, and some NIST config files because obviously I didn't configure this static binary to be as simple as I would have liked. Um, and those files I then make into a new tarball. So the first tarball is, oh, actually, I over it, overwrote the first one. Um, 
So here's the second tarball where I'm including all the extra dependencies and there's so many of them. Um, so that there is effectively the definition of my new container. Um, and the line above I'll, I'll use later but I'm adding it into this tarball so that I can just cat this tarball straight to docker build to build a new image that has the metadata of how to run it, what ports to expose, that sort of stuff. Um, and there we go. Having done it, the GCC image that I based the original build off is huge. Nginx adds another 200 meg. And then the little beastie that we just made that contains just enough to run Nginx is a huge 21 meg. Um, I'm assuming that somebody who actually spends a bit of time on it can bring it down a little bit further. Um, I basically pulled the instructions on building Nginx off the net. Um, so now I'm running random code. Um, Okay, and this is the, well, if we go back over here, again, with that container I was running this docker run command, so I'm actually telling it the application nginx to run with the parameters to keep it in the foreground. Um, and I really would rather not do that. I'd much rather just go docker run port 80 nginx. And so what I've done is I've added that docker file to my tarball and then built it so the first one that I showed before is a docker import. The second one is just catting it and doing a docker build with that docker file. And the difference in size is, I think I'll show it later, but the, the, the difference in how we run it are those two. Um, in that case, these two, they should be the same size. What I do after that is I go, well, that's hard to debug. So instead of basing it on Scratch, I base it on BusyBox. So now I can actually uh, Docker run Nginx BusyBox SH and have a look inside my file system. Um, but I kind of think those file sizes are starting to get closer towards what I'd really like to have. Um, and as I say there, uh, one of the... One of the ways that people seem to be thinking about small containers is to have a microservice in one each container and then to orchestrate those to talk to each other and then put a front end in front of it. And for that, obviously, a small container is a lot faster to upload to uh, AWS or wherever you're deploying. Um, please don't ask me Java questions. <laughs> and then, for extra credit, the thing I didn't do is make two. So if we had a base image that was busy box and added those libs in on top of it, um, then we'd be able to deploy that. And if the app changes, we'd only be having to, to send that 10 meg or so that is the Nginx layer. Um, and we're gone. Ha! Okay. And the other thing I sh should really show is those are the Docker files. Um, so I've got the busy box one up there. And then down below, I'm doing this as well with new base, which was um, supposed to be Debian, but I didn't do it. So that was about all I wanted to show. Um, and now I have a cool. chance to uh, give you answers to questions. Awesome. We have about seven or eight minutes uh, for questions. So hold your hand up, and uh, we'll get the microphone around too. So this gentleman down here first. Sorry, I'm uh, new to a lot of the things you're talking about. The, um, I was trying to understand why you were using that iNotify wait thing to... Um, I mean, iNotify is good. What were you you wait, waiting for the change of what? Well, iNotify wait really tells you what files were accessed when. Um, and, and so what I needed to do to fix the, 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 the dependencies is, is that it was obviously missing some libc um, libraries. Okay, so you're waiting to, to notify you that you've got the, the, the correct libraries uh, installed? Or well, you start, okay, stop so, so the Nginx image I made had nothing but Nginx in it. Right. And so it didn't have any of etc. Right. And 
I didn't want to go and look through the source code to figure out what files it needed. Mm. And they don't tell you because these are assumptions. Sure. You know, you've got a Unix yep, system. Yep. So instead, I notify just tells you, well, it's a kernel functionality that tells yep, yep, you understand. when files are accessed. Yeah. So as soon as Nginx starts up, it goes and accesses oh, those libraries. I see. So it's to it, fool Nginx into thinking. No, that, no, no. So, no. so what I'm doing is I'm going through and running this in a container where it works, yeah. which is the build static one, right. and watching what it, does, what it does to the file system. That tells me what files I need oh. that I can then put in the slim container. Oh, I see. So in other words, what you're doing is using iNotify to tell you which things um, uh, Nginx was, was looking for. Then you can yes. provide those things only. Okay. That's right. Um, yeah. I'm beginning yeah. to catch I, up. You know, my, my initial thought before I started work on this was just use LDD. But there's obviously data yeah, files more that it uses. Yes. So, yeah, Thank you. Um, yeah, my question. And my question is around that same thing with iNotify. So is there not some level of risk, um, and I'm not a C developer, so is there not some level of risk around it? you're not necessarily seeing some of the files it needs until yes. later on? And, and definitely, it, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely, yes. Um, I, you know, my assumption here is that I can do this because it worked for what I was trying to show. Um, post that, there's an awful lot of things you need to know, and hopefully if you're deploying it, you know them. But that, that's what, what surprised me when I started thinking about this is that none of the package management solutions we have right now document that because the assumption is that if you're installing a DEB, it's a DEB-like system. And there's a certain minimum, about 85 meg worth, of files that are in a base Debian that works. And that seems a lot less secure than knowing specifically, I'm going to touch these six files and that's it. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a, a collection of containers which uh, shared some common base images and I was trying to produce a single tarball that had those, just a single tarball which had the base image and then just the extra, extra images on top. Um, and I ended up writing a script which, which built a merged repositories file and, just, and then it just built a new tarball with all of those <laughs> images in it. Is, did one of those um, sh shrinkage commands that you showed there do something similar or was that, was that even valid? None of the ones... No, I, I don't know what uh, Docker Squash really does. Um, most of them are going to end up basically just extracting, as in doing a Docker export. Um, yep. Although I think Docker Squash might take each of the layers and squash the ones you ask it to. Um, so you've got to hope that it does the right job. Right, yeah. Um, okay. But that, the tooling around that isn't done because we're, you know, it's not something that we're supporting ourselves directly. Um, and third-party people are trying it out and seeing what happens. So, no, can't answer your question much. Um, so, you were using uh, Nginx, which is statically compiled. What would you do differently for dynamic languages? For which? Dynamic languages, like Ruby's uh, dependency management. <sighs> I, I would ask uh, somebody who's an expert in building those things to do it. Um, I, I've got a little more chance of doing it in Perl, um, but even that, I kind of went, that's going to be complex. Um, and it probably depends on the complexity of what you're trying to package up. Um, if it's something nasty like the open source project I used to work on, FossWiki and Twiki, then I'd probably actually just set up iNotify and bring in everything. <laughs> Because there's obviously a lot of system tools that are installed that we don't actually need. Um, but the, 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 the infectious thing about using iNotify is that if you can exercise all the code in your app, then you're going to get a canonical list of files it needs and its permissions that are going to be needed. So, like for example, Nginx, I think, only wants to read the password file. It doesn't want to write to it. Um, but then we could create a container that only allows it to read and certainly not to write, and it would exit on failure. Therefore, we've learnt a lot about whatever it is that we're packaging. Um, and so I, I kind of think most of this is going to be a learning thing, and eventually we'll know the answer to that. We have um, time for two more. Oh, sorry. Are you done? Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. We have, no. time, we have time for two more questions. Um, <clears throat> Does Docker provide any tools like system tap or dtrace for 
internal to containers? I think I'll punt on that and just say Docker is a thin little application launcher beastie that sets up some kernel parameters to, to wrap around what an application can do and see. And, and so if you want to do any of that kind of thing, what you're looking for is the normal Linux debug and kernel tracing tools. Um, and whether they can enter your namespace is a little bit painful sometimes, um, but it, it's not something that is intrinsic to Docker. Um, it's a Unix system. I know this. Uh, I did um, something similar to this with uh, MySQL. I just used the copy the binary in and basically kept on running it until I complained about the library, copy the library in, mm, repeat yep, it. Exactly. Uh, I was using the BusyBox container uh, as a base. And what I found is that the BusyBox uh, has a number of different uh, tags. And the BusyBox Ubuntu, with the Ubuntu tag, had most of the libraries in. So I, I suppose my question is. Uh, would that be the correct way to do it, or is, would there be? Uh, is that the intended use for the different uh, tags of the busy box, or? You know? I think the answer I was given to why we have these is because people have religion. Sorry. I think the the main answer I was given for why we have these different busy box images is because people have religion, and so some of them will prefer the uh, the build root one, and some of them will go build root ill. Yeah. And so we give them the Ubuntu one. Um, but no, I didn't know that there were that many more libraries in there. Um, cool. All right. Learn something new. So we'll, we'll let the very last question be this gentleman uh, right here. Um, do you think that a significant portion of this process could be made a lot easier if there was an explicit syntax for layer creation rather than an implicit one on every single command? almost like a checkpoint declaring this is where the layer starts, this is where the layer stops? I don't think there's anybody who feels that having some way to control when the layers get made is a bad thing. Um, the reason we don't have it is because we, we've tried a few implementations and none of them satisfy everything without causing more trouble. Um, I did read somebody had tried something else and it was so far looking very successful. So, you know, there is hope. But the, the problem is that in the Docker project, because we've become so successful so much faster than we expected, um, people want things before we've experimented enough to know whether we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. You know, um, and so, like, to me, bind mount volumes is a lovely example of something that everybody wanted that is going to cause trouble for the rest of Docker's existence. Um, and we've learned from that, and so we're you know, much slower about just saying, yeah, we'll do that, and writing some code and then going, oh, shit. Um, so, right. yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, being able to control all of those things is important. It's just a case of get it right. Cool. Thank you, Savannah. Thanks that's, very much. That's, that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much.